When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. May our testimonies be as deep and as strong as that of Jacob, who, when confronted by one who sought to destroy his faith, declared, I could not be shaken. Hello, Unshaken Saints, all you wonderful friends out there, and welcome to the finish line. We have officially made it. The last lesson of our New Testament year of study. It was 12 months ago that we went through the intertestamental period uh, and dusted off Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was a year ago that we spent time with shepherds and wise men in Bethlehem. And imagine all that we've gone through since then. We have gone through the Gospels and the Book of Acts. We have studied all the letters of Paul and his fellow apostles. We've spent two weeks on the book of Revelation and third time's the charm, or three strikes and I'm out, depending on how well I've done. Uh, but here we are in the last handful of chapters. Chapter 15 through 22 is what we'll cover today. And then the New Testament will, will be closed for a time. Uh, actually, I hope it never really closes. I hope that we continue to come back and continue to learn from its lessons. Uh, this has been an incredible year of scripture study for me, and I pray it's been that way for you. Now, these last two weeks particularly have been an absolute thrill to be able to oh, go through such rich symbolism. I actually got a, an email from one of you, an old friend I hadn't been in contact with in 25 years, give or take. And he mentioned that he was sitting there in Gospel Doctrine last Sunday and the teacher didn't make it. I don't know if they got caught up prematurely to heaven or, or what, but they, they, didn't, they didn't come. They weren't there. And they hadn't gotten a substitute, so everyone... Can you imagine this in Gospel Doctrine? I was just feeling for this poor brother. Uh, everyone's sitting there waiting for someone to come and, and lead the discussion. And when it dawned on everyone that nobody was coming, this intrepid friend of mine, based on what he'd been soaking up in our collective study of the book of Revelation, he volunteered himself. <laughs> he had the courage to go uh, to the front of the class, turn around and say, well, I'm, uh, I was expecting another teacher just as much as you were, but since they haven't come, well, I guess that leaves it to us. And he started the discussion with a prayer in his heart that the things that we'd been learning together would be brought back to his remembrance. And man, my hat's off to you. That, that's impressive. I would hope that the more time we spend in Scripture, the more ready we are to give a reason for the hope that is in us at any moment someone needs it. At the drop of a hat. In, in private conversation, uh, in, in a public setting like a gospel doctrine class, uh, I'm amazed by people who are learning to love the scriptures to the point of being able to teach them from the, the pulpit of the heart whenever they have the opportunity to do so. So hats off to you, my friend, and hats off to all of you who have been spending so much time in scripture together. Uh, I'll do the math as soon as this is done, but I think we've up, gotten about as close to last year's record of time spent in Scripture uh, as we can get, and that's, and that's saying something. Uh, like I said, I'll do the math, and I'll let you know, but it's amazing how many hours we have spent together, and, and that speaks more highly of you than it does of me. This is what I would do anyway. I, I just teach Scripture. But for you to carve out so much time to be able to study it with me is a, an honor for me, and again, speaks highly of the caliber of your souls wanting to, to do this. So let's dive in, shall we? We have been uh, meeting, a, we, well, we, last week we met a great red dragon. We met uh, the Grim Reaper and saw the Grapes of Wrath. We, we, we've gone through some intense things. And yet today, if all's well that ends well, then all's well. Because it, it does end incredibly well. Uh, at the end of, when all is said and done, Jesus wins. And if that becomes your two-word motto, Jesus wins, those are pretty good words to live by. Okay? Now, there's some things we have to get through to get the, to that side of things. Uh, we're going to see Armageddon today, but we're also going to see the glorious fulfillment of every one of God's promises as this earth becomes the celestial kingdom of God. To have Him present with us, oh yes, Jesus wins. 
So let's see how we get there. Okay, some play-by-play -play analysis. We're going to start in chapter 15, very short chapter. And in this one, we, we get a preview of exaltation. Uh, it, maybe it's jumping the gun. In some ways, you could take some of this out and put it near, closer to the end of the whole book. But to be reminded of this, again, we've been through some hard things lately. Uh, the beast in 13 and the grapes of wrath in 14. And so before we plow forward to the end, because Armageddon awaits us as well, can we just be reminded how all this ends? In some ways, if this is the coach's halftime speech, it's a, it's a good one. And we're going to be able to run out of the tunnel back onto the field, knowing that by the time the final whistle blows, Jesus wins. So stay on his team. Chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Now, we saw seven angels and seven plagues back in chapter 8 and chapter 9, so many of them reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. And here we see them all over again. There is an, an intense amount of repetition throughout the book of Revelation because there's so much repetition in life. And, and beasts aplenty come marauding across the earth, okay? Uh, there are harvests of souls in every generation. And those that are wrestling between taking the mark of the beast or the mark of the father in their foreheads. And so, of course, we should expect echoes of the new song as well as echoes of the dragon's words. And here we see an echo of annihilation. He goes on, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And we've seen already that that's how section 130 of the Doctrine and Covenants describes the celestial kingdom, the earth when it is renewed and receives its paradisical glory, okay? A sea of glass, compare that to the sea of chaos and commotion that the ocean is usually known for. And so to finally have peace on earth, oh, no more, no more raging waves and howling winds, no, a sea of glass. It's mingled with fire. So imagine this kind of purifying, cleansing fire, this golden and glorious light this is the celestialized earth. So again, preview of coming attractions. We're going to make it. And who's there to rejoice with God as he sits upon his throne? Them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. Remember the 666 we talked about before. They all stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And harps can be juxtaposed against the trumpets. Trumpets were announcing war. Trumpets were announcing, oh, clash and conquest and, and devastation and death. But these harps, oh, these are songs of praise. Let's go back to the book of Psalms and start singing once again, shall we? Yeah, we saw this, the new song in premortality, and its melodies are echoing throughout eternity. And we'll have a grand crescendo when all is said and done. And who's playing those harps? Who's singing these psalms of praise? those who have gotten the victory. We saw back in chapter 2 and chapter 3 all these incredible temple-based temple -based blessings for those who overcome. And here, what have they overcome? Amazing list. The beast. So think about this political aspect uh, of, of the kingdom of the devil. Think about Babylon in all of its, its beastly power. Dog-eat-dog -dog world. Survival of the fittest. Uh, man is wolf to every other man. And to see those who have gotten the victory over that, like, nope, that's not the game I'm playing. That's not how I'm going to function in life. I'm not going to gobble up other people as if they were my prey. No, I am. This is not a predatory approach to life. I think I'll follow the lamb. Thank you very much. Rather than the beast. So I've overcome that beast. I've overcome his image. So I'm not trying to fit in with everyone else who is playing the beast's game. I don't care if that leads to you know, ostracism and being shunned. Why aren't you playing our games? Why aren't you fitting in? Oh, I'm, that's not the game God has called us to play. Believe me, here we are. We, I just got out of halftime. I heard the speech again. And so I'm not interested in the image of the beast. I'm not drawn to his mark. And so to think of those who constantly have worldly cares on the mind. Oh, no. I have the name of God written in my forehead. It is holiness to the Lord. The number of his name? No, I'm going for the full 777. 
completeness, totality, perfection. I will not settle for six, six, six. These are those who have overcome the world. Ready to sing? Now, these echoes of the new song, look at verse 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. Ah, that is a song that all the world will eventually sing. When every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is the Christ, thou only art holy. Actually, those words have been turned into a song in our day. And if, you've, if you're familiar with the music, it's, it just rolls off the mind there. Who shall not fear thee and honor thy name? Thou only art holy, thou only supreme. To realize that there is no more competition <laughs> because there's no more conflict. And everyone has come to understand that Christ alone reigns supreme. No wonder this is an echo of the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Now think about those two. Uh, and so the Song of Moses is also known as the Song of Miriam. So there are altos and sopranos singing right alongside the tenors and basses. Don't worry. This is the full choir. And when Miriam and Moses sang that song, this is Exodus 15, right on the heels of the Egyptian armies being swallowed up in the Red Sea. Now, that's an important part of the story that we sometimes under, underestimate. Because think about how obstinate and stubborn Pharaoh was, where occasionally he'd come to his senses and say, fine, Moses, get out of here, take the people. But then he'd always return like a dog to its vomit and, and drag them back in again. And imagine the Israelites finally leaving Egypt, but always remaining worried if Egypt was going to come back after them. Their years in the wilderness, or even their time in the promised land itself, would have always been troubled by fears that the sounds of oh, mustering armies was off in the distance. And was Pharaoh going to track us down and drag us back to bondage? No, to be able to see the miracle of their deliverance, but then the miracle, I mean, it's a miracle when they see open, but it was another miracle when it crashed closed again. Because it signaled to the people of Israel, those former enemies will never come back to haunt you again. Can you imagine feeling that way about sins of addiction? About old habits that are so hard to break? Imagine the adversary being done once and for all. It's over the world and its warfare has come to a close. No wonder the sea is glass again. The crashing waves over the chariots of Pharaoh and then nothing but permanent calm, permanent peace. If that's the song of Moses and Miriam, can you sense it as an echo of the song of the Lamb? Think of those echoes of premortality when the lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed to open the book with the seven seals. With that, again, it was said and done, and we could rest assured in permanent salvation. Here we are singing it again, coming out of halftime, the locker room, ready to take on the second half, because we know how things end. Jesus really does win. Now, verse 5 and 6, After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So this is once again revealing the throne of God. Way back in chapter 4, we saw that, where the 24 elders, the four beasts, were there before God's throne. Here we are, doors open, or in this case, veil parted, back in the presence of God in his holy house. What happens there? The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, so seven, that number of completeness, totality. We had seven days of creation. Now we have seven plagues of destruction. But these angels are clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. They actually look a lot like the Lord as John saw him back in chapter 1 of Revelation. But these are destroying angels. Now remember, they're wearing white, not red. So it's not that, 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 remember back in chapter 14, end of the previous chapter, there's Jesus treading the winepress alone, staining all his raiment. There's destruction. 
trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. But here, these destroying angels wearing white? Hmm. This is, this is pure judgment being passed. This is not some kind of, oh, God in his vengeful anger getting it out of his system. And we're going to see more and more reassurance to know that it goes against all that Jesus would have wanted to have to pass condemning judgment upon the wicked. He has been calling them to repentance from the beginning, crying out to them to come unto him and be cleansed. But, they, but ye would not, to borrow the language of Scripture. So note, keep an eye on that as we go through these following chapters. But go to verse 7 and 8 and know what ha- notice what happens as these angels are then sent forth. One of the four beasts, remember we're here in the presence of God, so they surround the throne, covered in eyes, six wings, all their agency, all of their knowledge, worshiping God. What are they doing here? One of them gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And that's important to remember. We're not getting back into God's presence until we've made it through these final trials. Oh, the path to glory doesn't go around a tribulation. It goes straight through it. And yet, if we can hold to that iron rod as it makes its way through the mists of darkness, if we can keep our feet firmly on the straight and narrow path, we know where it leads. It leads to the tree of life. So hold on to that. It's interesting because as the temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God, remember the smoke of the incense altar is meant to represent the prayers of the saints as they ascend to heaven. So it's these saints that are praying for God's avenging power because destruction of the wicked equals deliverance of the righteous. Again, think back to Pharaoh and his armies. So where, do we, where, where are we left at the end of chapter 15? before we start marching forward towards Armageddon in 16 and the destruction of Babylon and beyond. Well, we have to remember that God is calling us forward. We know the eventual victory. And so as you face difficulty, press forward with an eye focused on the joy that is waiting for you on the other side. The way Elder Neil A. Maxwell put it is absolutely breathtaking. And this was from his very first talk as an apostle. We should have seen some amazing things coming if this was his first impression. But in that initial apostolic talk, he said this, Yes, there will be wrenching polarization on this planet, but also the remarkable reunion with our colleagues in Christ from the city of Enoch. Yes, nation after nation will become a house divided, but more and more unifying houses of the Lord will grace this planet. Yes, Armageddon lies ahead. But so does Adam on Diamond. Oh, if we can get through the first, we will make it to the second. Talk about prophetic words from Elder Maxwell. And here we are living in a day of unifying houses of the Lord dotting the planet at an ever-increasing rate. Yes, we seem to be headed toward Armageddon. But hold out hope for Adam on Diamond. That's coming too. With that in mind, I think we're ready for chapter 16. And any dark days we see in the next few chapters, try to strain your ears to hear the echoes of this song. Okay? Song of Moses. Song of the the Lamb. Song of victory. It's on its way. Chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So drop the reins. Take off the emergency brake. You are ready to run forward. These destroying angels let loose upon an unwary world. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. No wonder it was so important back in chapter 15 to overcome that mark, to avoid that image. This is meant to remind us or foreshadow the kind of destruction of the wicked that will occur prior to the second coming. So in some ways, we are now in the 3rd Nephi chapter 8 moment that leads very quickly to the 3rd Nephi chapter 11 moment. 3rd Nephi 11 in the Book of Mormon is when Jesus comes. 
Third Nephi 8 in the Book of Mormon is where the wicked are destroyed. Uh, it's a, the Book of Mormon is a scale model of the last days, okay? And to see these days leading up to the coming of Christ, here we are at destruction. And this one, again, is meant to remind us of the plagues of Egypt. No wonder we're singing the Song of Moses already in advance, right? So these, these vials are poured out, and the first thing that happens is, are these grievous sores upon everyone. In verse 3 and 4, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. So we've seen the first poured out on the earth, the second poured out on the sea. Keep reading, and we'll see it poured out on the air later on. And so all the elements, sea, earth, land, it, it's going to be covered by consequences. There's no escaping other than repentance. So he pours out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. Again, this is all reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt, and does this sound like the Nile being turned to blood? That was the second angel. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. So yes, we're back in Egypt, and hopefully by now we're starting to get the clue. Where will we find water if all the water's been turned to blood? Well, there's another kind of water that has been changed because of the blood of the Lamb. The only water worth drinking at this point is living water, so don't settle for anything less. In verse 5 through 7, we get a brief pause in the destruction. Wait for a moment, and we'll get to the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th angels. But here, right after the destruction of the wicked through the, through the seas, through the waters, notice the reassurance that is given to the Lord. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shalt be. So there's past, present, future. We've seen it so many times. And why this statement of God's righteousness? Of course God is righteous. Everyone knows that. But notice the way these words come. Thou art righteous, O Lord, because thou hast judged thus. For they, the victims, have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And by worthy, it's not worthy of blessings or worthy of reward. No, it's worthy of this punishment. A better word for worthy there would be deserving. They are deserving of the kind of condemnation that they are now suffering. Next verse. I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Now, this pause is absolutely essential. Because we are starting to really see the destruction of the wicked ramp up. And there's a part of us, I'm sure, that wonders if this is a sin against mercy on God's part. Oh, fine, you've been just, and yes, they deserved that, but where's your mercy in all of this? Well, his mercy has been there every step of the way. His mercy was sending prophets and even raising them when they'd been slain. Remember, go back to that chapter. He has been crying repentance in hopes of helping us avoid the consequences of our sins. But at some point, does final judgment have to be passed? We'll see that clearly in chapter 20. But here, these preliminary judgments, as the, as the wicked are destroyed at the end of the world, I can only imagine how the Savior must feel. In fact, I remember a student years ago, one of my first years teaching seminary, we were talking about the signs of the times and the fact that judgment will be a great and dreadful day. Uh, that the second coming will be wonderful for the righteous and devastating for the wicked. And then this wonderful, I think, sophomore girl raised her hand and said, but don't you think for Jesus it will be both? And I sat there, one, well, what, do, what do you mean by that? He's on, the, he's on the good side. He's the captain of the good guys. So great day for him. We won. But in her sweet sensitivity, she reminded me of something I'd overlooked. She said, but for Jesus, he cares as much about the wicked as he does about the righteous. And seeing them suffer... Won't that be a devastating day for him? A dreadful moment when he finally has to pass judgment because they wouldn't let themselves be saved? That was an eye-opener. That was a heart softener for me. I needed that. And to think in this moment, would the Lord himself need reassurance? 
This is the God who weeps, remember, from Enoch's, Enoch's vision, Moses 7. This is a Lord who was, how oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? But he would not. And because you won't, I can't save you. And so no wonder the destroying angels themselves, and who else did he mention? Those who were, that this voice that came out of the altar, you remember the altar of sacrifice? as the sign and symbol of the fifth seal, the age of martyrdom. So you have all these martyrs, you have these saints, you have these angels who have suffered at the hands of the wicked. And they have been crying out, not for mercy, well, yes, mercy for themselves, but justice upon their persecutors. If they would have changed, we would have forgiven them too. But they haven't changed. They don't seem willing to. And so, Father, for our sake... Come to our rescue. Free us from the Egyptian armies that always seem to be waiting in the wings. To me, I'm fascinated by the thought of these destroying angels reassuring God of his righteous judgment. Even to the point where they say, they have shed the blood of all these people whose voices are crying from out from underneath the altar. Okay? But because they have shed the blood of saints, thou hast given them blood to drink. Seas full of it, waters running, rivers running with it. They got exactly what they asked. That is the law of the harvest. That is reaping what they've sown. And since they shed rivers of blood, then blood is the only thing they'll have to draw out of that river for them to drink. I'm actually reminded of a haunting moment in Joseph Smith's life, right at its close. He's there in Carthage jail, surrounded by enemies that are bent on his destruction and the death of the saints that were following him. At one point, Joseph looks at these leaders of the Carthage Grace that had come in kind of gawking and staring like, I want to see old Joe Smith, the prophet. And Joseph asked them, do I look like the kind of person that I've been described as? Does it look like I'm guilty of all those crimes that they're accusing me of? And the mobbers say, actually, no. You don't look like the devil incarnate the way you've been depicted. But then again, we can't see your heart. So maybe you just fake it well. Now, Joseph's response to that is absolutely fascinating. Because he admits, you're right. You cannot see my heart. But I can see yours. And this is what he says of those hearts. Very true, gentlemen, you cannot see what is in my heart, and you are therefore unable to judge me or my intentions. But I can see what is in your hearts, and I will tell you what I see. I can see you thirst for blood, and nothing but my blood will satisfy you. Does that sound like what we just saw these angels say? Because they've shed the blood of saints, that's all they'll have to drink is that blood? Well, Joseph went on, Inasmuch as you and the people thirst for blood, I prophesy in the name of the Lord that you shall witness scenes of blood and sorrow to your entire satisfaction. Your souls shall be perfectly satiated with blood, and many of you who are now present shall have an opportunity to face the cannon's mouth from sources you think not of. This was 1844. And less than 20 years later, these scenes of blood would be passed upon the United States of America as brother fought against brother and father against son, as north and south erupted in conflict unlike anything anyone had seen before. Casualties on a scale of death and destruction, where there were rivers of blood that no one would have imagined before. This is, honest, during that time period, many of the Latter-day Saints, safe in territorial Utah, looked back and saw this as the judgments of God, the righteous judgments, because those, had, those people there had rejected the prophets and slain the saints. And thirsting for blood, that's what they were drinking. It's exactly what's described here in these verses. Okay? And, and again, it's all in terms of reassuring the Lord. 
Your justice is not unmerciful. You have given them every opportunity. So true and righteous are thy judgments, O Lord God. You are worthy in all the right ways, because they are deserving of this judgment in all the wrong ones. From there we see the fourth angel. And in verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, We've seen destruction on sea and land. Now let's turn to the heavenly bodies. Remember one of the signs of the times was that the sun would be darkened. Well, here it's intensified before that happens. The sun, the, the destroying vial is poured out upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And yet notice the last phrase, which is so devastating. They repented not to give him glory. All of these things, this was redemptive turbulence, at least it could have been, if they would have come to their senses and realized where they would, were headed. Again, this is exactly like Pharaoh, who kept being shown what awaits and yet consistently refused to repent. Is the same thing happening here. If you think back to the parable of the sower, it was on stony ground that plants didn't have enough depth of root to get to the water table. And thus, when the sun began to beat down upon them, they withered and died. Sunlight is supposed to be helpful. It helps us grow. And this kind of chaos can help us grow spiritually if we'll turn to the Lord, the source of living water. Without it, however, that sun will, will burn us with scorching heat. And we'll end up shaking our fist heavenward, blaspheming the source of punishment that was meant to be the source of our protection. In verse 10 and 11, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. Uh, we're getting up close and personal with the enemy. This is the epicenter of destruction. It's where evil emerged, and so we are going to take it right to this target. It's poured out upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And yet again, they repented not of their deeds. There they are, just like the beast before them, stubbornly unwilling to change. Verse 12 to 14, then the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now, the Euphrates is basically the eastern border of the, the Middle East. And yet the thought of that river, it, the river is a border, it's also a barrier. It's hard for armies to cross rivers, right? And so to be protected somewhat by the river Euphrates. And yet here, it's now dried up. Why? So that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. They can come marching across the dry riverbank. This is like Joshua coming into the promised land as the, as the Jordan River is stopped. But this isn't Joshua coming in to conquer the promised land. These are the enemies coming in to destroy the seat of the beast. There's nothing holding back the destruction of the wicked at this point. Notice the next verse. I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That battle will be named in just a moment. But to see what is gathering them, what's drawing people ever closer to this violent end? Well, it's these frogs that are coming out of the mouths of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. Those three, oh, it's almost a, a trinity of sorts. And as they collectively come together to breathe forth falsehood. Can, can you picture this? Again, the, the symbolism of Revelation is absolutely breathtaking. And to picture dragons and beasts and, and, and false prophets spewing forth frogs. Remember, frogs was one of the plagues of Egypt, too. It followed right on the heels of the Nile being turned to blood. And those frogs were everywhere. Now, the interesting thing about a frog is it's amphibious. 
it's as comfortable in the sea as it is in the land, right? Or in the water, water and sea, I should say. And to picture, that's a pretty good depiction of a falsehood. A half-truth, maybe better said. Is a half-truth amphibious? That where does it belong? Is it over here or over there? Is it sea or land? Is it water or land? And, oh, it's both. And these frogs can just come <laughs> hopping out of anywhere to convince you to move in the wrong direction. Remember what came out of the mouth of the Lord back in chapter 1? A sharp two-edged sword. There is truth. There's the word of God. But to see these half-truths and falsehoods hopping their way <laughs> up around everyone, how will we do at navigating the lies of a wicked world? We've got to learn to overcome it. But those who fall for it, no wonder they are being drawn together, gathered to this final battle of self-destruction. In verse 15 and 16, a word of truth pierces the falsehoods. Jesus speaks and says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. One last effort on his part to let them know you've got to change. You've got to overcome these frogs of falsehood. I am watching. Are you watching in return? I'm coming as a thief in the night, and if you are not prepared, like the foolish virgins in the parable, then you will be shut out from the marriage feast. That's actually a symbolism John is going to use in a coming chapter. But to see this moment right here before the final battle, the Lord inviting them one last time to change. Please watch. Please keep your garments. Remember the parable of the marriage of the king's son? And the man who came in without his garment on, his wedding garment, he was cast out with weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. John is drawing on all of these, uh, these images, trying to paint a picture as, as <laughs> the way he's doing this is absolutely incredible. Again, the Euphrates is dried up. The enemy kings are on their way. There's nothing to stop them now. There's, this is going to be a final cataclysmic battle of complete annihilation. And if you're not ready, you will be caught up in it. You will be moved, pushed forward, herded in by this swarm of frogs, pushed to a place of complete destruction. No wonder. One last chance. Honestly, verse 15 feels almost like an interruption, but that's because that's what it is. Jesus giving us one last call to repent. Please keep your garments. Do not walk naked. And remember, naked means uncovered, and cover is the Hebrew word for atone. Do not go out into this wicked world uncovered by the atonement of Jesus Christ. Do not be out there fully exposed to the demands of justice. Come and be covered by the wing of the mother hen. Please come and allow me to protect you, cover you with the armor of God. If not, you will be ashamed. Ashamed of your nakedness, ashamed of your consequences, ashamed that you didn't heed the word to repent. And for those who didn't heed it, notice verse 16. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This is the only place in scripture we see that word. And to have it become an English word in our vocabulary when originally it was Hebrew, Har Megiddo is where we get the word Armageddon. And Har is a mountain, and Megiddo is the name of a city in northern Israel. Har Megiddo, it's, it's more hill of Megiddo. It's not quite the mountain of the Lord, okay? But the hill of Megiddo, Megiddo factored into several major conflicts in the Old Testament. In some ways, it was a crossroads, the middle of a very fertile valley, this is a place that's meant to feed the world, as far as the Israelites were concerned. And yet, instead of a place of feeding the hungry, it is a place where they're going to reap the harvest of their own souls. 
This is no longer the breadbasket. This is the coffin of the world. As opposing armies have come in to clash in hopes of conquering. I've said this before that through much of Old Testament history, the, the promised land was a crossroads between, between kingdoms trying to become world superpowers, whether from the southwest, like Egypt, trying to conquer the world and spread, or kings from the east. Remember, Euphrates is out there. Kings from the east, like the Assyrians, or the Babylonians, or the Persians. And they would come in from that, their direction in hopes of conquering Egypt, or Egypt would come from their direction, hoping to conquer them in return. And poor Israel was always caught in the middle getting black eyes left and right as two rival superpowers were fighting right there in the midst of them. And Megiddo becomes this interesting metaphor for those kinds of clashes. There's a, it's, it's hard to think of a better image, a better symbol than Megiddo here for John to call upon, where all nations have come to fight against one another. Okay? With that, verse 17 and 18, the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. We already saw land, sea, sun. Now the air itself, what is it that you're breathing? Is it conflict? Is it wickedness? Is it violence and destruction? This vial is poured out into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven. Remember, it was opened earlier in the chapter. It came from the temple, it came from the throne, and this is what it said. Just three words. It is done. Think about Christ from the cross. It is finished. Here, the battle of Armageddon has come and gone. The wicked have annihilated themselves in a battle of self-destruction. We talk about mutually assured destruction, MAD, and yes, it is madness to, to, to build up these nuclear arsenals to the point that no one would survive final battles like that. Well, it is finished, the wicked are gone, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, sounds like Sinai all over again, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great, so shaking like nothing they've ever experienced before. Remember, earthquakes were the defining sign of the times for the sixth seal. And here in the seventh, just before the coming of Christ, a shaking like they'd never imagined. We deal with the shaking of faith. Is there the shaking of the foundations of society? Is there ever any solid ground to stand upon? Wise men and women are still looking for rocks to build upon. But where are they? Hard to find. So think about this in terms of the final destruction. That's what's happening throughout this chapter, chapter 16. And after the seventh angel has poured it out, it is done. Armageddon is behind us. In verse 19, the great city was divided into three parts. Perhaps there we think celestial and terrestrial and telestial. Who's left? The cities of the nations fell. Does that remind us of the fall of the great and spacious building in Lehi's dream? Does it remind us of the fall of Babylon that Isaiah talked about in chapter 14? Well, we're going to see it here, loud and clear. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God. Finally time to pay the piper, right? To give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's the bitter cup that Jesus himself was willing to drink in their stead. But they refused and therefore had to drink it themselves. Every island fled away. The mountains were not found. Remember we saw that back in the sixth seal? Where do you go when your places of refuge are fleeing as well? When sanctuaries are on the run? Well, there was no place to run, no place to hide from consequence. And one last act of destruction. There fell upon men a great hail out of heaven. Every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. Perhaps this one was the straw that broke the camel's back because it broke everything. I mean, consequences are literally raining from the sky. 
and there's no avoiding them. Uh, the weight of a talent, I mean, we talk about, have you ever seen hailstones? I mean, often it's what, the size of a pea? From there, golf ball, baseball, what are we talking about here? A talent weighs somewhere between 60 and 80 pounds. Can you imagine a block of ice coming crashing down with that kind of weight behind it? Talk about violent intensity. Tragically, what, what could that hail have been? It could have been cleansing rain. You've missed the waters, haven't you? Since they all turned to blood. If it would have been gentle rain falling to wash away the consequences of these final battles, to begin to fall again upon the plains of Megiddo so we could grow and produce food again. Ah, oh, we could have had the bread of life growing because of this living water, but this is not water of life. This is water of death and destruction. It is frozen, and it is bringing destruction in its wake. To think about what's come of the world by the end of chapter 16, which side will we be on? When the piper comes to be paid, have we repented? Or will there be consequences? With that, when you turn to chapter 17, you get echoes of what Isaiah had said back in chapter 14 of his writings. Oh, how thou hast fallen, O Lucifer, son of the morning. You're just like the king of Babylon. And there you sat, you, you lie in, in the mud, basically. You lie in the grave more accurately. And we look down at you and think, this is what we were so afraid of? You? You're no better than us. In fact, you're infinitely worse. Why was I so concerned about beasts and images and marks when you're nothing? That's the realization that comes in chapter 17. Starting in verse 1, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now in some ways, this is simply a repeat of chapter 16 from a different angle. We've already seen the angels pour out their vials of destruction, and there's nothing left. But let's review it. Let's do an instant replay, shall we? And look up at it from a different camera angle. And this time, we are going to personify Babylon as this immoral woman. Jeremiah, Isaiah, other prophets in the Old Testament did that about oh, the prostitute Israel and her backsliding sister Judah. The problems that they were causing, being unfaithful to the Lord. Their covenant infidelity was what caused their destruction. Well, same thing's happening here. And so, do you want to see this again in terms of the judgment upon the great whore? After all, it's one of the seven angels. They just poured out their destruction. Well, let me show you how it looks from this side of things, okay? And the way they're described as the wine of her fornication, wine is supposed to be, oh, the, the drink of rejoicing. This is, this is festivities and, well, yeah, that's what they've been dreaming of. That's what they thought things were. It's amazing what happens though when you're a little intoxicated with the wine of the world and you start getting a little fuzzy as far as how you're looking at things and a little tipsy. You can't quite tell if you're on the straight and narrow path. I mean, a sobriety test? Oh, the world's going to fail that every time. So what do you do with this wine of fornication? Well, most people that are plastered end up falling to the ground. And that's exactly what happens to this woman. If you think about what we saw back in Revelation 14, that chapter about the grapes of wrath, earlier on there was an angel that cried, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We're seeing this played out all over again. And to get a better view, verse 3 through 5, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and remember, wilderness here is an image of apostasy. 
It's away from the life-giving fields of righteousness. No, it's out in the wilderness. We're going to just let things go wild. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. Now this, we already saw a woman in the wilderness back in chapter 12, right? That was the woman clothed in the sun, laboring to bring forth this child, the kingdom of God. And yet the woman was carried off into the wilderness to be nourished through the apostasy. This is counterfeit all the way through. Here's another woman. And she's sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast. Well, there's the counterfeit for the lamb. And this beast is full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, maybe that's what makes it hard to tell that it's such a blasphemous beast, even though it has those names written all over it. It's the heads that keep turning and changing. It's the horns that keep pushing us in different directions. But we know what it is when we pick it up. There is blasphemy written all over it. And on top of it, oh, there's where the woman rides. The next verse says, The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. How's that for false royalty? Staining blood instead of the redeeming blood of the lamb. She's clothed in red rather than white, suggesting that her quote-unquote royalty is one not in pure ways, but through violence and destruction. She's decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand. But what's it full of? Full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. This is disgusting. This is, this is haunting, what, th- th- this image that John is giving us. One last detail. Upon her forehead, we've seen the mark of the beast upon those that followed in their direction. But this woman, what's on her forehead? Ah, it's a name written. In fact, several of them. All synonymous, but here's the list. Mystery. Oh, maybe that's how she comes across at the start. Oh, who is this mysterious woman? And all of her seductive beauty trying to draw me to follow after her. Oh, mystery. Second name, Babylon, the great. Oh, but it's the greatness and grandeur of this city. Third name, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Oh, now it's starting to become more clear. Not only is she unfaithful herself, but everything she produces as she has intoxicated the world with the wine of her fornication, everything she produces is unfaithful as well. It's abominable. We've talked about this many times, about the, the analogy between Christ and the church as a husband and wife metaphor, a marriage metaphor. And here we see the other side of things. Christ is to the church as Satan is to the world also known as Babylon, also known as the whore of all the earth, also known as the great and abominable church. These are the things that Nephi saw in his apocalyptic visions back in 1 Nephi. And remember, the Lord said to him, I showed the same things to John, and whatever you don't write, he will. Well, John's writing it. To see the two mothers vying for the attention of the children in this eternal custody battle that we're in the midst of, And will we follow the woman who's coming out of the wilderness, fair as the sun and clear as the moon? Or will we be caught up in the mystery of Babylon, not realizing who she's married to? Well, not really married since it's all unfaithful on that side. You understand? These images are meant to move us in the right direction, in some ways by scaring us off of the wrong way. In verse 6 and 7, John saw the woman... And notice, tipsy, sure enough, drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. To think about the wine of of her fornication, that's one thing. But to be drunk with the blood of the saints, we saw wine representing the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, again, counterfeits on this side. The blood of the saints. There she is dipping her golden cup beneath the altar of self-sacrifice and drunk with their blood, thinking that she's beaten them. She's conquered, triumphed over her enemies. Notice, though, when John saw her, he wondered with great admiration. And that's a horrible translation, because admiration is more a sense of shock and awe, of 
of almost a horrified disgust that just drops your jaw and leaves you astonished. How could this be? He wondered. The angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? It's like, why are you so shell-shocked by this? What do you think she was after? He then says, I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So, you ready to understand this? I want to explain part of this mystery so that you can solve it in the right ways. I mentioned last week, or two weeks ago, I guess, that John in the book of Revelation paints three main pictures of Babylon to show it from different angles. And the beast is the political aspect of Babylon, doggy dog world. This woman, this harlot, this prostitute, is the ideological aspect of Babylon. Uh, I've heard it said, I, I studied rhetoric, and rhetoric was often called the harlot of the arts. Because if you're just, oh, using words and trying to be persuasive, anybody can hire rhetoric. Oh yeah, she's, she's willing to, to sell her wares to the highest bidder. And to those that are trying to seduce people into purchasing whatever it is that Babylon has to offer, oh, they'll fall for it hook, line, and sinker if you can get them sufficiently persuaded. Well, if rhetoric is the harlot of the arts, then the harlot here, again, is a perfect des description of ideology, philosophy, religious views, just anything that works on the mind to seduce, to tempt, to persuade. And John is seeing this played out. The next chapter, chapter 18, we'll see in a moment, is the third example, and that's the merchant city, which signifies the economic aspect of things. They're all coming together to paint this horrific picture of Babylon. And here the angel himself wants to make sure that John is getting it. In verse 8 and 9 he explains, The beast that thou sawest was and is not. So wait a minute, it's a thing of the past? It's not a thing of the present? Then why am I so worried? Well, keep reading. It shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Now, you've sufficiently confused? It's like, wait a minute, angel, I thought you were here to solve the mystery, not, not <laughs> confuse me by another one. Well, here's the issue. What, what did you learn about the Lord earlier on in the book of Revelation? He's past, present, and future also. He was and is and is to come. But also at a time he was not. He was killed. He was crucified. But he came back from the dead, conquering death in the act. Well, in a similar way, but in a counterfeit way, this beast, oh, once you think you've finally slain him, he just comes back again in a new guise. This is the hydra cut off one neck and two more will reappear. This is... Kingdoms come and kingdoms go, an hour of pomp, an hour of show. But there always seems to be another worldly kingdom waiting in the wings. <sighs> Will we ever fully overcome it? Well, yes, we've already been singing about that. Haven't you heard? But in this moment, I need you to see the beast more clearly than perhaps you ever have before. So John, in your present moment... And later readers will have present moments of their own. But for you, right here, right now, let me explain this. Verse 9. Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, John wouldn't have blinked an eye at that. He would have known exactly what the angel meant by the seven mountains. Because Rome even to this day, is still known as the city of the seven hills. Now, seven, we've seen repeatedly as a number that symbolizes totality and completeness, wholeness. And in some ways, it seems fitting that Rome, at that time, would be the city of the seven hills because this is, this is the world's superpower in John's day. Seven hills, not just Rome. We're talking the whole world. Hills as far as the eye can see. It seems like the Roman army has marched forth upon those well-constructed Roman roads as far as you can imagine and conquered the world as we know it. Rome then becomes the microcosm 
of the macro-Roman Empire. And to see this city as the center of it all. Now, please do not think Catholicism. This is not Catholicism for John. It would be years and centuries before Rome became the real headquarters of the Christian church. At this moment, for John, it's the headquarters of everything that is antithetical to the Christian church. It is the seat of the beast. It is the throne of the woman. It is the merchant city in terms of headquarters. It's Babylon brought back to life. And so just like we've seen Egypt as a symbol of the wicked world, like we've seen Sodom and Gomorrah as symbols of the wicked world, as we've seen Babylon, Babylon is the one that seems to just run from here on out. And even in the Doctrine and Covenants, we're told to flee Babylon because it's such a fitting image. And yet Rome becomes the image of Babylon in John's day. And so to picture Rome as the, I mean, I've heard it said that right, late, lately, if you've seen these memes, that everybody seems to be thinking about the Roman Empire. I don't know why. But how often do you think about the Roman Empire? Well, if you think about it symbolically, you're, it's on your mind all the time. Because the Roman Empire is Hollywood. The Roman Empire is New York. The Roman Empire is all those, it's all those cities I mentioned back in chapter 2 and chapter 3 with their modern equivalents. Ideologically, philosophically, Rome is Boston, right? Uh, governmentally, Rome is Washington, D.C. As far as entertainment, Rome is Hollywood. As far as economics, Rome is New York City. Uh, as far as, oh, hedonism, Rome is Las Vegas. Rome seems to be everywhere present. There's no escaping it. It's seven hills are popping up everywhere you can imagine. But those hills are counterfeits for the mountain of the Lord. And we better be able to tell the difference. We better be able to overcome the Roman Empire in our day. It's political power, it's intellectual influence, it's philosophical force, it's social status. All of those are ways that the world is too much with us and we have to be able to overcome. Now verse 10, the explanation continues. There are seven kings. Five are fallen, one is, the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now, what on earth was that all about? Well, in a way, this is simply a parade of villainous kings, one after another. Like I said already, kingdoms come and kingdoms go, an hour of pomp, an hour of show, and it's like, next, next, next. And so you had these seven kings, five, they're already gone. Think about Roman emperors, for example. Maybe that was on John's mind. And we've had this array of enemies of righteousness, Caesars who think they are God incarnate themselves. Oh, no, no, that already came. The word was made flesh, and it wasn't in Julius or Augustus or any of the rest. It certainly wasn't Nero. It's not Diocletian. It's not these enemies of the kingdom of Christ. It's those that are trying to create a kingdom of the world. And some are gone. Some we're waiting for. You see, some are yet to come, but they always seem to grow out of the last. And then when it talks about ten horns being ten other kings, they haven't received a kingdom yet, but they will. They'll get their hour with the beast. In section 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, there's a parable about each servant in the vineyard getting an hour to rejoice in the joy of their Lord. Well, here you have the devil's version. Kings reigning for an hour, but reigning for the beast. Ten is interesting too, by the way, because if you think about Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the kingdoms coming and going from the head to the shoulders, to the, to the torso, to the legs, to the feet, to the toes, and going from gold to silver to bronze to clay to, or excuse me, to iron, and then to clay mingled with iron. 
How many toes would that statue have had? Ah, ten of them. And here come these ten future kingdoms. Well, verse 13 and 14, doesn't matter how many toes there are, these have only one mind. That's why it's kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Different kings each, each hour, but it's the same beast behind them all. It's the same red dragon breathing into them his way of doing things. So these have one mind. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. That's who they work for after all. They're just puppet figures in his hand. These shall make war with the lamb. And that's the bad news. But here's the good news. And the lamb shall overcome them. Remember our motto? Jesus wins. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him, three beautiful adjectives to describe, are called and chosen and faithful. And yes, those who are called and chosen, since many are called but few chosen, well, you've got to be both. And in fact, how do you do both? By being faithful all the way through. They have to be of one mind as well. If wickedness is fully unified in pursuit of the beast's goals, then the righteous saints better be equally unified. One heart, one mind, dwelling in righteousness, no poor among us. Zion better be one incredible team as well with Christ at the head, calling every play. With that, verse 15 and 16, he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Picture these foaming masses, swirling, crashing against each other. Picture how easily tossed they are by the winds of doctrine, by the currents of culture. Oh, Peoples, nations, kingdoms, tongues, yeah, waters, as far as the eye can see. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. How's that for an intense description of her eventual end? Wait a minute, they they hate the whore? I thought they were going in unto her, seduced by her mysteries. Well, yeah. But once they got what they wanted, they tossed her back out on the street. There is no love loss there. There's no loyalty among, there's no honor among thieves, as they say, right? There's no loyalty on the devil's side of things. Think about what the Jaredite civilization did as it cannibalized itself. It goes back to that mutually assured destruction, the madness I mentioned before. Think about how the Nephite civilization came crashing to its end with the Lamanites swallowing them up, but then the Lamanites turning on themselves, on each other in acts of self-destruction as well. It's almost like, oh, we, we just want enemies. And once we've killed our enemies, we turn enemies, we make enemies out of friends and we start fighting amongst ourselves. Yes, they hate the whore. And so though they at one point were clothing her in scarlet and purple, Now she is desolate and naked. And yes, cannibalized and consumed in destroying fire. So that the chapter can end in verse 17 and 18. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Interesting. That though this is an act of self-destruction, God does allow it to happen because it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. Okay, so he's put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. He's not causing them to do this. No, but he's allowing it to happen because judgment is being passed. So he put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdoms unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So this woman is Babylon. No wonder she's called the whore of all the earth. There's some interesting metamorphoses going on here. Because by the time you shift from 17 to 18, this whore becomes the merchant city. She grows into the city on, of the seven hills. And that actually makes sense when you really think about it. It's tough to tell the difference sometimes between the ideological and the economic the philosophical and the political, it all seems to be one big mass and one big mess. And how do we extricate ourselves from it? It's hard to say. 
Where does one end and the next begin? And again, no wonder John is just giving us different angles on the same object. And that object is the wicked world. Whatever you might want to call it, however you perceive it, we have to come forth because Babylon is falling. Now, chapter 18 paints this in, most, in, in economic terms. Okay? We've seen the beast clearly. We've seen the, the mother of harlots. Now let's look at the merchant city and see what becomes of it. I, I love chapter 18. It's, well, love and hate. Okay? The way it's depicted is so oh, true to form. When I was a little boy, I loved going through the Sears catalog. It was before internet, and especially as Christmas approached, and just look page after page and wonder what I, what I should want. And, oh, talk about the harlot of the arts. Yes, it was all so seductive, so appealing, so enticing. I wanted it all. Well, we're going to see exactly what this merchant city buys and sells in this chapter. Verse 1 and 2, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Now, based on what this angel is about to say, he sounds a lot like the one in Revelation 14 we've already quoted the one that announces to the world that Babylon the Great has fallen. Sure enough, this one echoes the same kind of announcement. He cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. It's like he had to repeat himself because everyone's like, what, are you kidding me? There's no way. Uh, the, the stock market can't collapse that far, okay? You, you can't overcome the world in all of its aspect. Well, it, it, it's gone, it's fallen, it's fallen. And then these three interesting echoes. It's become the habitation of devils, there's the first, and the hold of every foul spirit, there's the second, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird, that's the third. And if you think about the order there, ah, no wonder we were so seduced into now moving our citizenship into a place like this. At first, it was simply a habitation. I didn't realize they were devils. They were so bedecked in other things. Uh, but I guess I was deceived. I just thought I was moving in, and, I mean, they kept telling me that housing values were going to keep soaring, that the stock, the stock market would continually increase. Uh, as long as you just trust us, believe, your, but your money's safe here. Just come and dwell. Hollywood's amazing. The weather's incredible. Uh, look at all that we've got to offer you. Well, unfortunately, what started as a habitation quickly becomes a hold because it gets a hold of you. So much easier to move into Babylon than to move out of it. And so habitation has become hold. In fact, by the time we're, all is said and done, it's not just a hold. It's a cage. And there's no escaping. The locks on the door that at first kept, well, they kept God out, have now closed on me and they're keeping me in. Is there any escape from Babylon? Especially now that I've heard rumors that it's destined to fall. Can I withdraw? My money? Can I close my bank account? Can I take my assets and run? Ah, that's the question. It's interesting because in some ways it, it shows us something that Alexander Pope said in the 18th century. Amazing poet. Uh, Alexander Pope, famous lines, famous lines. He said it this way. Vice is a monster of so frightful mien as to be hated needs but to be seen yet seen too oft, familiar with her face. Uh, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. And that seems to be what verse 2 has described for us. I didn't realize it was a cage or a hold. I simply thought it was a habitation. And I embraced that, not knowing that eventually, like I said, it would close in on me and there would be no escaping. We've got to be careful. This is what Nephi described as the flaxen cords. 
that keep getting wrapped around us until they turn into strong bonds from which it's hard to escape. That's the description here. Now, verse 3, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. No wonder we're all stuck here. All nations have been drinking this stuff. Uh, it, we had no idea its intoxicating effect. We had no idea it would affect our vision, make it hard for us to stand up straight. We're all wasted on this wine of fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Ah, that's how he got trapped. It was these delicacies. You know, in some ways, there's no avoiding completely the world economy, the buying and selling. Everyone is subject to some kind of alluring pull. It's amazing how seductive the world's wares can be made to appear. And her delicacies being oh, peddled by every merchant, in some ways they don't care what they're selling as long as we're buying. I read a book uh, recently, well, I've spent a few years now, on the history of advertising. I actually just met with a student of mine who's a marketing major, and I showed him the book. He's like, wow, I, what did you read that for? And I said, well, as one who studies rhetoric, it's the buying and selling of certain philosophies, ways of doing things, ways of seeing the world. And it was interesting to read a history of advertising in America and realize that what they were really selling was not products, but rather the desire for more products. What we're really selling is commercialism and consumerism, and people are eating it up. Because as soon as they buy one thing, thinking that's going to satisfy my hunger, no, what we've been selling you is the hunger itself. And that way, it's never satiated. And you just keep wanting and keep buying and keep purchasing. And, and you are never satisfied with what you have. Interesting that we've fallen into that pit. But notice verse 4 through 6. I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. That's always the invitation. Please repent. Okay, I'm trying to wake you up. Uh, you got to sober up. Get away from the wine of fornication and realize where, you're, where you are. Come out of her, my people. Think how often in the Doctrine and Covenants we're told to flee Babylon. Well, here it is. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. There's choice and consequence. Get out of the sin, and you'll avoid the plague. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. How can he forget? They're staring him in the face. They've reached to heaven itself. And so he has to pass judgment now. And here it is. Reward her, even as she rewarded you. And double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Oh, he's speaking their language with words like reward and words like double. I mean, talk about a return on your investment, right? Double whatever it was that you put in the pot. Oh, and with returns like that? Yeah, no wonder I keep playing the game. No wonder I keep gambling because I seem to win with every hand. Well, this is a losing hand when all is said and done. And yet the Lord is going to reward those in ways they have, quote unquote, rewarded others. Remember, you were th thirsty for others' blood. Eventually, blood is the only thing you'll have yourself to drink. Same thing going on here. This is the law of the harvest. This is reaping what they've sown. These are multiplied plagues and a bull market for sin and their consequences. No wonder we have to flee Babylon. We've got to get out while we still can. You see in verse 7 and 8, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. This is she as the harlot, that is now she as the city. And man, look at her. Just like we saw the woman clothed in scarlet and purple, the city itself seems to be decked out in similar attire. Just glorious, delicious is how everyone seems to be living. But notice the result. Remember, she's going to be rewarded even as she rewarded others. So here's the judgment. So much torment and sorrow give her. 
For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, and mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. Oh, what an insight into how she is now convincing herself that the bill will never come due. She seems invincible. I'm too big to fail, as we heard in a recent economic downturn. And as long as it's being propped up by the populace, then sure, I'm no widow. Are you kidding? I'll always have someone to provide for me. I'll never be left on my own. I'm a queen, after all. Look at me astride my incredible beast. Look at me sitting here amidst this magnificent city. None of this will ever come crashing down. Well, you ever heard of a stock market crash? You ever heard of a housing bubble bursting? The dot com? I mean, there are so many examples throughout history of things that seemed... I mean, when was the last time you shopped at a Blockbuster video? And yet Blockbuster seemed to be invincible, right? Uh, these, uh, when was the last time you shopped at a Sears or a JCPenney's? I mean, these institutions that had been centuries old. And then, uh, to drive past a mall, this is an interesting one, to drive past a mall and see empty parking lots. And what are we gonna do with all of this retail space? Do we turn it into a junior college? That's happening more and more. To get to this point where it is death and mourning and famine one day later. And the company that thought it would be here through everyone's retirement doesn't even make it through a lifespan. No wonder verse 9 tells us that the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. They'll be standing afar off for the fear of her torment. That's interesting, by the way. If they're standing afar off, it's like, ooh, I don't want to be a part of her. Ooh, is she starting to feel like a widow now? But I thought you were mine. I thought I was yours. I thought we were going to support each other. I thought we were a match made in heaven. Uh, no, they, this was a match made in hell, and there's no loyalty there. It's all lust and no loyalty. What do you think fornication and adultery is? Well, they fear falling into the same torment. So it's like, nope, wash my hands of it, and I'm going to stand afar off and just watch. And they will say, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. But notice, this is self-serving sorrow. Why are they mourning? <laughs> are they sorry for what she's going through? No, they're only sad about what this means for their bottom line. They weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. This is a going out of business sale like no one's ever seen. These are stockpiles of merchandise that nobody wants anymore. What am I going to do with it? And having gambled on the fact, or, well, it's no longer a fact. That's been made brutally clear. But having gambled on the hope that every investment comes in and these get-rich-quick schemes of course we're going to be able to line our pockets. I, to me, honestly, as powerful as the beast might seem, and as seductive as the mother of harlots is, in our economic age, I wonder if Revelation 18 is the most appropriate image of them all. Because we do live in a day of capitalism, consumerism, commercialism, that is so intently self-serving. And we have to be careful. Politics so often seems to be more of a matter of economics. And who's rich enough to run? 
and lobbyists paying money. And it, is power just pursued when it's economics that's really the driver? Is the beast wow, almost purring at the feet of the of the president and CEO of the merchant city. And same with the ideologies and the philosophies. Is the woman, has the woman, no, I mean, no wonder the woman morphs into the merchant city. Because why are people wanting an education? So often it's not for education's sake. It's, I just want to major in whatever's going to make me rich. And the, the tragedy of all of this is when those earthly cares go up in smoke. What will we have to show for all that we've been trying to amass? Well, let's make it even more personal, shall we? Look at verse 12 and 13. And what is it that Babylon buys so cheap and sells so high? Oh, I mentioned the Sears catalog. Well, here's the Sears catalog of hell. It's the delivery boys from Babylonian industries. And notice what they buy and sell. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls. And that stands to reason. Everybody wants to have those costly things. Interesting because these were things that were meant to be used for the high priest's breastplate of judgment. But oh no, I can refashion those into something much more self-serving. Turn the page, see what else is for sale. Oh, how about the fine linen? You'd look so good in this. I mean, fine linen was meant to be used in priestly robes and tabernacle veils. But imagine how nice you would look wrapped up in this finery, especially if it were purple and silk and scarlet. Ooh, those were the colors of the beast, weren't they? Keep reading. We also sell all thyine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble. If that's not what you're looking for, how about this? Cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense. I know most of that is supposed to be used for the altar of incense, but no, don't send prayers to the, to the heavens. Oh, start praying for yourself and use this frankincense to enrich yourself. If that's not what you're in the market for, how about wine and oil? Uh, there's not so many good Samaritans anymore using that to care for the wounded travelers around them. Instead, they're drinking this wine and rejoicing in this oil, all expended on themselves. What else you got? Fine flour? How about wheat? Any beasts you need? Are you in the market for sheep or horses or chariots? Well, to me, what's most powerful is if you were to go back and reread verse 12 and 13 without any of my color commentary, just fly through the pages of the, the Sears catalog. Okay, and how does it end? Because everything we've almost been lulled into this sense of oh, appetite that can never be satisfied. I just want to buy more and more and more and, and put it on my tab and I'll pay you later. But notice how it all ends. Yes, it's gold and silver and stone, precious stones and pearls. Yes, it's fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet. Yes, it's thine wood and ivory and precious wood and brass and iron and marble. Let's go with cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense. Let's bring on the wine and the oil and the fine flour and the wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. That's what Babylon's been after all along. Everything else has just been bait to trap us in the cage that this merchant city was designed to become all along. Slaves, souls of men. You want to talk about the objectification and commodification of human beings? That's exactly what Babylon's after. I mean, we should have known that, right? What was this merchant city before? She was a prostitute. The ultimate example of objectifying and commodifying a child of God. Now we just buy and sell each other. And whether it's corporate greed, whether it's Neglecting the poor, 
that are doing so much of the work and not making much of the reward? There are so many examples of this kind of mentality all around us, and it is a haunting judgment, condemnation of the way we approach the buying and selling of one another. I, I don't know all the solutions to this. Well, I do. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Consecration is the cure for commercialism and consumerism. It's coming to buy milk and honey without money and without price. It's coming to him who has the riches of eternity. The one who was able to say to Satan when he offered him the kingdoms of the world. Eh, yeah, no, I'm not interested. Someday the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And yeah, I can wait. Okay? I'll take a mansion on high over a mansion down below any day. That's why I'm not lamenting over this worldly stock market crash like everyone else seems to be. You see, verse 14 and 15, the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee too. And thou shalt find them no more at all. Sorry, we're all out. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Just like we saw a few verses ago. Remember Uncle Mike pointing out how many of these words started with D. The dainties and the delicacies and the deliciousness of it all. And yet now those D's have been replaced by other ones. Like death and destruction. It's all that's left. And how do they respond? Verse 16 through 18, they were saying, Alas, alas, that great city. They are mourning. Again, self-serving sorrow, but still. That great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. All those things I saw on the pages of the catalog. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And every shipmaster, and all the company and ships, and sailors, and as many as trade by sea, stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Oh, you see how everyone was in on the game? Everyone trying to make a buck, now mourning and lamenting their losses. Verse 19, they cast dust on their heads and cried, Weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness. For in one hour is she made desolate. That's the part that shocks everyone to no end. They keep bringing it up. How could this have happened so quickly? When we thought, I mean, this is the destruction of the city of Ammonihah. Remember in the Book of Mormon? Like, oh, that'll never happen to us. Oh, it happened faster than anyone imagined. But if that's the reaction on the, on the side of those that were self-serving, notice the reaction on the side of those that were serving God through it all. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. There's the justice they've been waiting for all along. So mourning among the wicked, rejoicing among the righteous, judgment has been passed. To the point that verse 21 can say that a great angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. And no craftsman of whatever craft he be shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in thee. There's something fitting about this as well. If you think about something Jesus taught in the Gospels, where he spoke of a millstone being used to hang around the neck of any who offended one of his little ones, and then cast that millstone into the depths of the sea. It would have been better for that person never to have lived. And that is strong condemnation on the part of Jesus. 
Well, we're seeing that condemnation being passed here. And so take the millstone, and that's the end, and again, a perfect image for the kind of merchant city that Babylon has become. Because with a millstone, what do you do? You grind grain. This is, you, you harvest things, and it's all about the harvest, and how much can I gather in? How much can I okay, underpay my agricultural workers out there harvesting the wheat? So that I can then grind the wheat into flour and then overpay those same poor people. Or overcharge, I should say. So they overpay for the work they've been underpaid to do. Interesting how that works. And who gets rich all the way through? Oh, the owner of it all. And what ends up happening here then is, okay, they're not using the millstone the way it was intended. They are not grinding grain to be able to feed the poor. No, they're feeding themselves on the poor. In fact, I, was it, I should have looked this up. I can't remember if it's Isaiah or Amos, but they talk about grinding the face of the poor. Ah. And how's that for millstone imagery? Instead of grinding grain for the poor, you're taking the poor and grinding them. Which means you are using the millstone in a way it was never intended and if that's the case, fine. You want to stick with your millstone? It will stick with you. But it will drag you down to self-destruction. Intense what John is describing here. He's trying to wake us up from our intoxicated slumber. So he closes this chapter, verse 23 and 24, with this. The light of a candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. And hold on to that imagery because it's going to come roaring back in chapter 19. Some beautiful juxtaposition here. But here in Babylon, nope. No bridegrooms rejoicing. No brides preparing themselves for the wedding feast. Because that's all gone. There's not even candlelight anymore. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, but they're gone. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Remember, deception is the crowning sign of the times in the last days. We've been deceived. We've been, we've been suckered into buying something of no value. And unfortunately, Babylon has a horrible return policy. It won't take any of it back because it knows it was worthless to begin with. The chapter ends, In her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. No wonder they had to pay the piper. This is an interesting end of this chapter and an interesting end of the bad news. The rest of the book of Revelation will be far more glorious. So stick with me. Okay. Chapter 19 and 20 and 21 and 22 has, have such they're glorious things yet to come. But the way the bad news here comes to its close with the collapse of the economy of Babylon, to see, think about this, no candles. No light. You can see the glow of Las Vegas from miles and miles away in the deserts of Nevada. It's almost an oasis in the desert, or at least it's made to appear that way. Oh, come and stay as long as you'd like. To see the lights of New York City, for example. You can walk down Times Square in, at midnight, and it seems like broad daylight with all the electric glow. But that's gone. It's out of business. How about the bridegrooms and brides? Uh, don't they have like drive through weddings in Las Vegas also? No, there's no more time for weddings when all we have are funerals. And Tinsel Town, yep, that's all it was. Just Tinsel. And all that glitters is not gold. No wonder it was described as sorcery and deception. It's all Babylon had was smoke and mirrors. <laughs> Magic to make something seem worth the price when it isn't. I mean, honestly, what John has portrayed in the last few chapters ought to arrest our attention, ought to stop us in our tracks. 
we've got to pause here and get our bearings, look around and realize what we've been up against, but what has become of it all? The beast has eaten itself. The mother of harlots has been abandoned by those with whom she was committing fornication. And the merchant city, the merchants are, have all closed up shop. There's no more slaves and souls of men to buy and sell. I mean, honestly, pause here, because like I said, the rest of Revelation is glorious good news. But pause here and remember these three aspects. Okay, you want a chart? I'll give you one. You've got the beast, the whore, and the merchant city. Describing Babylon in its political aspect, its ideological aspect, and its economic aspect. The beast is there growling us into subjection to its pride and ambition. The whore is seducing us with her calls to lust and appetite. And the merchant city, what's it selling more than anything else? It is selling materialism and greed. If you go back to the temptations of Jesus Christ in the wilderness, there were three of those as well. And they mirror these three aspects of Babylon perfectly. The beast was Satan's call to Jesus to jump from the temple because there's pride for you. There's ambition. There's power if you'll take it because the people will come running and realize who you really are. The whore was the one that was coaxing Jesus into changing stones into bread. Now, how's that for an appetite that you could easily satisfy if you just give into it? And the merchant city, there's the third temptation of Jesus. Worship me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Back when we studied those earlier on this year, I mentioned that those three temptations mirror the three kings of united Israel. There were only three who ruled all 12 tribes. Saul, David, and Solomon, and those three kings of Israel succumbed to these three temptations. King Saul was devoured by the beast because it was his pride that vanquished him. King David was seduced by the mother of harlots and gave in to the lust of the flesh, while Solomon did end up worshiping the world so that the world would worship him with all of its so-called glory and grandeur, its materialism, its worldly wealth. He had it all until it all came crashing down. What amazes me as I ponder these in light of the book of Revelation is the temptations that overcame the three kings of Israel did nothing to tempt the king of kings. He overcame them all. And he is inviting each of us to do likewise, to see through the beast and realize that there is a lamb far more, far more worth following, to ignore this woman in her scarlet and purple robes and come to the woman clothed in the sun, ready to bring forth her man-child. And the merchant city, oh, I don't have time for that. I don't have time to buy or sell there because I'm trying to build a city that's far more celestial. It's the new Jerusalem for me. And so your temptations, they're not that tempting after all. Once I can see through them, and it's Jesus Christ himself that gives us the eyes to see.